Right, so um, I'm going to put my timer on. I have written stuff, but I might go off piece. Sorry. <laughs> um, hold on. Right, so this kind of springs from research I did when I was uh, a postdoc at UCL. Um, I had a British Academy funded postdoc on the history of popular publishing in archaeology. So I'm going to be talking mainly about archaeologists in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century. So as universities were starting to incorporate archaeology departments, um, as a first generation of students were um, studying archaeology at a higher education level and then going out into various kinds of work. The landscape is very different from today in that there were fewer sort of salaried um, university posts in archaeology and that meant that most archaeologists weren't working within a university structure which affected their publishing choices. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, they weren't publishing in scientific journals. In fact, lots of scientific journals were available or being founded at the time. Um, but they were also alongside those sort of um, venues. They were also very much publishing within um, a popular sort of general and educational publisher market. And so I'm going to be talking about that side of things. And um, so that's what I focused on in my book. So I just thought I would start with a sort of general slide. How many of you are familiar with these titles? Good. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to point out um, something that I was thinking about when I, when I pitched for this session. Um, the fact that in the 1950s, people like Kathleen Kenyon and Leonard Woolley were starting to create books that were guiding people towards what, it was, uh, what was needed to be an archaeologist. And they were coming off of, I think, a tradition of um, popular publishing that was explaining archaeological processes to a public. And that was partly because um, the archaeologists in question were dependent, at least in Britain, on the public mostly for the funding to do the work that they were doing. So that kind of um, gave them a push to um, operate in a very popular way as authors. Um, but one of the other things I wanted to point out in this talk was also that um, archaeologists were writing for children. Um, and this is part of a sort of long tradition of um, publishing children's books. Um, not all of these are by archaeologists, I have to say. Um, but uh, Reading has, I'm at Reading now as the um, research officer of the Year Museum, um, which, if you haven't been, has an exhibition on right now about children's books in archaeology. <coughs> Um, but they also have a massive children's collection that was started by um, two lecturers, well, one professor and one lecturer who were married to each other, historians, um, Frank and Doris Denton, um, quite famous sort of early medieval historian. They, um, as a side project, collected lots and lots and lots of children's books. Um, and among the titles that they collected are quite a few that have to do with either archaeology or sort of classical subjects. And so I've put a selection up here, just so you can see. But one of the things I was thinking about is um, how those books might have affected um, the choices that people made to either become an archaeologist or not. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, the research that my um, postdoc uh, generated um, was published in this book, which you can download for free from UCL Press. <laughs> book plug. Um, but in it, I really started with a network of archaeologists that I've studied for my PhD. Um, who were, broadly speaking, British archaeologists who worked in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East, because a lot of the focus of um, their publishing efforts for the public were focused on, you know, sort of adventures abroad and that kind of thing, um, and also guidebooks and um, other kinds of tourist-driven um, works. And that was a really handy market for people, which meant that essentially they had um, two sets of readers, Right, readers who were based in the UK, and also readers who were going regularly overseas for things like the winter season in Egypt, for example. Um, I was also looking at women who were um, the first sort of students in archaeology, so that was um, people like uh, Helen Tirard, who was a student at UCL in the early days of the Egyptology department. Um, a lot of these women were um, not just students of archaeology, they were um, freelance lecturers and tour guides, and so they were essentially using their um, expertise 
to package it in a way that would be accessible for other women who were not necessarily um, uh, sort of going to embark on um, full-time archaeological studies, but were still interested in the subject. Um, and that was a way for them to have a post, or an unofficial post, if you like, a freelance post, um, that would allow them to publish and also to develop courses outside of a university structure. And that was really important, and they were able to um, market themselves in that way because they already had an audience for publishers. So um, I also wanted to look at the um, relationship between archaeologists and publishing houses. And this is a sort of selection of <coughs> publishing houses that were represented. I didn't look at the archives of all of these houses, I hasten to add, um, because a lot of them uh, either no longer exist. So the ones in black, sorry, the ones in red are closed. The ones in black are still going. Um, and the ones in blue have been merged into like large conglomerates <coughs> of publishing. Um, so I was really looking specifically at um, three publishers, Macmillan, um, Penguin, and uh, John Murray, all of whom published <coughs> lots of archaeology books for a sort of general audience, but um, with a sort of strong um, a strong link to archaeologists who were practicing in the field at the time. So the first publisher that I want to talk about is Macmillan. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the history of the company, but it was founded in the mid-19th century by two brothers from Scotland called Daniel and Alexander Macmillan. Um, they uh, were very successful in their business, and um, eventually it came into the, the management of their children. And George Augustine Macmillan was one of the children. I can't remember if he was Daniel's son or Alexander's son, but anyway. Um, one of the, the children who was in charge of the company in the 1890s. Um, but George Macmillan was very interested in the classical world, and he had taken a trip to Greece with Oscar Wilde and John Mahaffey and some other people, um, and had been totally sort of um, overawed by, uh, by his trip to Greece and uh, was a founding member of the Hellenic Society subsequently and eventually became the um, secretary for quite a long time of the British School of Athens. Um, and in that role, he was championing the work of the British school students. Um, he was raising money um, through things like this, um, newspaper adverts and um, notices for the school's work. Um, the school had quite a lot of funds that they would um, gather subscriptions for from the public and from things like Oxford and Cambridge colleges, and he was, played a sort of massive role in that. But one of the other things that he did was to instigate, um, or at least put into place, a series of handbooks on archaeology called the Handbooks of Archaeology and Antiquities, um, published from the 1890s. Um, it was actually the um, brainchild of Francis Kelsey, who is a professor of classics at Michigan. Um, but the company was British, and it was very clear, it's very clear from the archives that um, uh, Macmillan wanted to have, George Macmillan and, and his um, uh, relatives wanted to have a controlling interest in this, as opposed to the um, American branch of the company who had a um, sort of cohesive role in it. Um, so they appointed um, Percy Gardner, who's a professor of uh, uh, classical archaeology at Oxford, and Percy Gardner selected from amongst his acquaintance um, the, the titles and the texts that he wanted to publish. And there were a few American um, scholars in there, but there was some concern about whether American scholars would be uh, marketable in the UK. And because Macmillan London had the controlling interest in this, they were very sort of um, select about the people that they included. One of the people who pitched for Macmillan um, this series was Caroline Ransom, who was an American Egyptologist, um, had her PhD from Chicago. And she wanted to publish a book on Egyptian art in this series, and they said no, because um, you're not well known enough even though she was highly trained and about to embark on a very successful career at the Met. So you can see a bit of gatekeeping, um, even in the 1890s. Um, another person who was slightly successful, but not totally successful, in his British publishing experience, or at least his publishing experience, was um, this man who's Horm Hormuz Rassam, who was the, um, one of the key archaeologists working for the British Museum in the mid-19th century. 
um, a student of Austin Henry Laird, but he was from around Mosul. And in the 1890s, he wrote a book which he was unable to sell in Britain um, or to get a publisher to publish in Britain. And um, so he published it in America. Um, it's called Asher in the Land of Nimrod. But um, in the archives at Reading, there is um, a letter, a very sad letter actually, from, uh, well, responding to him in the early 20th century. He had sent a manuscript of a memoir that he'd written of his life to ANC Black, who a big um, sort of reference a nonfiction publisher. And they said, no thanks. We can't see that this book has a market in England. So he was still coming up with um, barriers to his attempts to capture his life in archaeology. And a lot of memoirs are the, the sorts of books that are um, shaping what people perceive about archaeology. So the archaeological archaeological memoir is a really marketable package, and a lot of archaeologists at the time were producing these in one way or another. So it was a really important feature of archaeological publishing. Um, one of the other really important um, <coughs> sort of uh, roles that, um, or uh, publishing venues that archaeologists had were um, fortnightlies. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with these, but essentially they were um, short uh, sort of magazine type publications um, which were sold in parts at a very inexpensive price. Um, so starting at six pence or seven pence. Um, and uh, they, uh, the point of, the, of them was that um, you would bind them into sort of big encyclopedia type volumes, but they weren't really encyclopedias. They're more like um, textbooks, really. And they were meant sort of for sort of um, self-education or for schools. And a lot of archeologists wrote pieces for these books. Um, a couple of different publishers produced them, but probably the most um, prolific of those publishers was um, the Amalgamated Press, um, which was a sort of subsidiary of Harmsworth Publishing. So like big <coughs> Daily Mail publishing empire started by Alfred, Alfred Lord um, Northcliffe. Um, and he had an editor called John Alexander Hamilton. Um, and Hamilton, or Hamilton, um, basically uh, got lots of archeologists to contribute texts. So there were a series of um, these sort of um, uh, fortnightlies which um, were published at various points and rewritten at various points in the, the years between the sort of um, 1900 and 1930s. Um, and you can still find these books today. I mean, they're incredibly problematic in lots and lots of different <laughs> ways. But <clears throat> they also, um, he wasn't necessarily that interested in um, publishing academic archaeology. He wanted people who had experience in the field, people who had practical experience that he could sell, basically. And so we have people like Flinders Petrie, um, obviously Leonard Woolley, all the big names are writing for this series, but also quite a number of women. So Margaret Murray wrote a lot quite um, frequently for the, the series. Um, and um, I can't remember the names of the other ones, but there are Catherine Rutledge, who was working in um, the Pacific, and a couple of other people. Um, so I can't sort of not mention Leonard Woolley, even though I've mentioned him just, just now, but he was um, one of the most successful popular publishing um, archeologists of the sort of early 20th century, because um, he used the radio in order to craft his text. So, um, he began broadcasting almost as soon as the BBC opened, he was broadcasting. Um, and he was doing regular broadcasts on his excavations. He would, um, <clears throat> when the Listener magazine started in the 1920s, the late 1920s, he was uh, publishing his, his talks in the Listener. Those talks were then gathered up and published in Digging Up the Past, which was originally published in hardback by Ernest Benn. And then once Penguin opened, um, it was number four of the, the first 10 books that they published in 1937. And it was because he was already famous by that point. Um, but I mentioned Ernest Benn just now. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, but um, Ernest Benn predated Penguin as a paperback publisher. They started this um, series called the Sixpenny Library in the 1930s, uh, sorry, late 1920s. Um, and the idea was that they would produce lots and lots and lots of copies of these texts 
so that they would be really cheap, six, six pence. Um, the, um, the first couple are archaeological titles, they're probably quite difficult to read. Sorry about that. Um, but um, less so when it gets sort of later. But one of the books that was published in this in 1930 um, <coughs> was a sort of precursor to the text that um, people like Kath Kathleen Kenyon and um, Leonard Woolley were producing in the 1950s about how to get into archaeology. And that was Stanley Casson's um, Archaeology. Um, and um, another thing I just wanted to mention quickly, hopefully I have a little bit of time, um, was um, tourism. So this is um, a magazine called uh, Egypt and the Sudan, and it was published in the sort of late, or mid to late um, 1920s. And it was a tourist magazine that was marketing Egypt for you know the people going to Egypt for the winter season, but it's also a really interesting um, venue for archaeological publish popular publishing. Um, so lots of archaeologists wrote for it. Um, Margaret Murray, um, Winifred Bunton wrote for it, um, and you can see that they're trying to sort of smush archaeology in. I mean, obviously it's Egypt, so archaeology is everywhere, but. Um, but there are lots of other articles here, and I think it's really important to view archaeology within the context of all the other things that they're trying to market about Egypt. Um, this is, I just put this in because it covers Salim Hassan, who is um, the first professor of Egyptology at the University of Cairo. Um, the, there's a whole run of these magazines, which are very, very hard to find um, at the Egypt Exploration Society, so it's a really nice resource um, to look at. Finally, I just want to mention um, this conference. Has anyone heard of this conference before? Because um, they're um, among the sessions, they were talking about education and archaeology, and I think it's a really nice way to end um, this <coughs> talk because um, it sort of mentions the popularity of archaeology in the 1940s, like right in the middle of the war, and what the future of the subject is. So, um, because I'm out of time, I won't really talk about that too much. Um, but I just wanted to to end it here, and hopefully that's been a good um, introduction to the world of popular publishing and archaeology, so thank you.